All right, cool. So it's time to move on to the next exercise, in which case we're going to go and take a look at exercise four to see what we're going to do here. So here we're going to configure atomic tests. All right. So do you remember how I told you there are four ways to set the state of an application so that we can have atomic tests. Well, the fourth one is using JavaScript and that one we're actually going to do together. You're going to do less watching me talk and more actually hands on coding. So this is how we're going to make this happen. Uh, you need to make sure that you're on the right branch. So this is the branch that you want to be on for configure atomic tests. So here's the exercise that you're going to go through and you're going to make this test atomic. Here is the login. I'm sorry. Here's the checkout feature test that we have been working on and we can go ahead and run it to see what it actually does. So we can just click here and run. Of course you can use Maven to run as well. And then I'm going to log in here to sauce labs. Here's the test being executed. Check, uh, should be able to check out with items. So this test, as the name implies, validates that a user can check out with items. And here we can replay it as soon as the video is available. Here's that video. Let's watch the replay. So you can see we log in as a standard user. We add an item to a cart. And then we go through the checkout process. This is all using Selenium. Now, this is already a pretty good test. This is very short. You can see 19 seconds, which is really nice. I strongly recommend your tests run no longer than 30 seconds on your local resources ever. If your tests are running for longer than 30 seconds on your local resources, it is highly probable that your test is not atomic. And this one is really short. It's running 19 seconds in sauce labs with a little bit of latency, uh, but it's still not atomic. Why is this test not atomic? Well, let's take a look here as we go through what this test actually does. So we log in, right? And we log in as a user. So once we are logged in, we just tested the login functionality, right? We have to validate that we are logged in before proceeding. So that's one functionality that was tested. Here's another functionality that's being tested, adding an item to a cart. We're validating that an item was at is added to a cart. And then finally, we're going through the checkout process. But ultimately, this test only really cares about this. The test only really cares about you having an item in your cart, and then you filling out this form and being able to see the appropriate screen, which is going to be this confirmation screen. So here's what the test really cares about, what the UI really cares about. So look, we're going through and we're going to click this. And then we're going to click the finish and that's it. That's what the test really cares about. All the logging in and the adding the item to a cart that makes the test not atomic because it's other functionality that's being tested that doesn't need to be tested. This functionality can be tested elsewhere. We can have a login test, which we already have. We can have a add to add an item to a cart test as well. And those two features, if we know they work, we don't need to retest them in our end to end scenario. So rather what we're going to do here is use JavaScript to be able to inject a user and an item into the cart so that then we can follow the appropriate checkout process using Selenium. But the other setup steps are going to be done using JavaScript. So go ahead through this exercise and make it happen. Uh, pause the video now. And when you come back, I'm going to show you exactly what we did and how we made it happen. All right. So welcome back. Hopefully that exercise wasn't too hard for you. Uh, the test should look like this. Let's zoom in a bit. Here's what the test should look like at the end of that exercise, you know, plus or minus a few modifications. And ultimately, it should work. So let's go ahead and run it, make sure that it works. We're going to come back here to Sauce Labs. We can see that there's a session running. Let's go to Automated Test. Here's our test case running. Let's go ahead and see it executing. And it's already done. This one finished in, as soon as it's done, we'll see how long it took. This one finished in 14 seconds, so we've already taken five seconds off the execution time. And if you want to take a look at what happened here, what we did was 
several things. Number one, we hit the checkout page directly. We didn't even need to log in. We didn't need to add an item to the cart. We hit the checkout page directly. So we bypassed all of the UI steps that we were performing previously that may introduce flakiness and introduce extra level of effort and introduce extra maintenance. And we've bypassed it by hitting the page directly. Next, you can see here at this point, we've used some JavaScript to inject uh, items into a cart. We injected two, you can inject one, you can inject however many you want. Um, we've added two different ones and we also injected the user. Uh, we did that through this script right here. So here is how we injected a user into a uh, session storage of the browser. And here is how we injected items into the cart. So these are the JavaScript commands. They're also in your code. They were shown to you. And now at this point is where Selenium actually comes in, clicks the checkout button and makes sure that a user can check out. See how that's a completely atomic test. The only feature tested here was whether a user can check out. The item is already in a cart. Can you click the checkout button and does it take you to the appropriate page? That's the scenario that was tested. All the other scenarios you can test independently of this one. They will all fail independently. If this scenario fails, for example, you know that the checkout feature is broken. It's not because the login broke on your way to do the checkout. It's only because the checkout feature broke, right? I mean, of course, the application can not render for whatever reason, whenever you hit the uh, checkout page, the page cannot render, but then all of your tests would fail if the pages aren't rendering. But in this case, the test will only fail for a single reason. That's what makes the atomic test so powerful, but also it makes it way more stable and way easier to maintain. And of course it's faster to execute because now you can utilize the power of parallelization to run all your tests in parallel, 180 tests in parallel versus 18 tests in parallel and get faster results, faster feedback and more stability. And this is another fantastic example where I actually worked with a developer to make this happen. We obviously implemented this sauce demo application for everybody to be able to test with it. And at some point I said, Hey, look, I know we don't have a back end. This is all a front end application. There's no back end so that we don't need to maintain it. Uh, how can we make sure that a user can control the state of the application so that they can check out with actually, actually having to log in. And we work to come up with this solution of controlling the state of the application. You should be able to, uh, work with your developers to figure out such solutions as well. Besides all of the advantages that atomic testing provides, you can see that now our test is even more cleaner. We've introduced more page objects here. Our test is cleaner and easier to read as well, which is really nice. Your next task from here is to continue to clean up duplication. Remember throughout our entire automation process through software development, this is the normal standard, but of course, through automation process, which is software development, we always want to find duplication and remove it. We don't want to remove too much duplication, but we want to remove enough so that it decreases the amount of maintenance. And so if we look at, uh, all of our page objects here, for example, uh, this confirmation page, right? You can see that here's some duplication. We have duplication where we're setting the driver. We have duplication with the driver. Uh, we have duplication between this and the login page where we have a visit method. This is unique and that's unique, but check out the login feature Oh, Sorry. Check out the login page login page also has a driver that's being set. It also has a visit method inventory page inventory page also has a driver that's being set confirmation page also has a driver that's being set also has a visit method. So all of these pages, uh, have some duplication. And at this point we're going to remove it. And that is where a base page class comes in. And that's where you have to implement this exercise. Number five, you're going to implement a base page class and extract all of the duplication so that, um, the duplication is gone from all of the classes. 
and here are the instructions uh, for how to extract that duplication and once you are finished go ahead and do some coding when you come back of course i will show you the answer all right welcome back welcome back so hopefully that exercise was really easy for you so go ahead and check out branch six so here's the branch that you should be on you should be on this branch now to see the solution and the solution looks like this uh, we've got a base page class. We've now put a driver object in here so that all the other classes don't have to store it. And we also created a constructor uh, that sets the driver for this uh, base page class. And then ultimately what that did is remove all the duplication from every single one of the classes. They don't have to have a driver property. And rather than setting this inside of uh, every single constructor, uh, all it does is set the uh, construct the super constructors driver. So we're just basically setting the driver in the base page class versus each of the single pages. So you can see that there's all that logic removed. Now, I got a little bit lazy. I could have also removed the duplication from here, right? The visit method. You can see how that's pretty similar here. We're always just visiting here. So you have... Uh, some options that you could have gone here, which you can you could have done is extract this part into something like a base URL and store that in a base page. And then this visit method, you could have extracted this part to base URL in stored in base page. And then uh, this navigate method can just navigate to this part of the URL here so that this you just reuse the base page url uh, property and then insert this for every single page object or you can even make it more advanced if you want and you can put this visit method inside of the base page class and then uh in here force every child page to override a method maybe call it something like page part url and then it has to override it and when it overrides it it will supply this part so ultimately in the base page class what you're going to do is you're going to have a visit method that does this part and then calls a method called uh get base page uh sorry get child page url or child or child page part and that child page part will be implemented in every single one of the pages those are the options that you could have gone with here um, I leave that up to you. Uh, the second method is a little bit more complicated, but it's potentially better because it re reduces all the duplication and then you don't need to have a visit in every single child object. But then all of your pages have the visit method, which may or may not be necessary. And so that makes it potentially inappropriate. So maybe the first solution is actually the best.